presentation is Frank McPherson from the Department of Environmental Science Policy and Management at UC Berkeley. We have a conversation beforehand what his title is, so we settle on Specialist Emeritus. Sounds kind of cool. <laughs> Not as cool as High Priestess, but. <laughs> um, Bryce has uh, been involved with Sudden Oak Dad pretty right, much since the beginning, he set up one of the very first plot networks, and he's continued to work with this plot network as well as move over into the East Bay. So I think he's going to talk to us about today. Uh, thank you, Dave.
larger the coastal eye bone that's infected, the more likely it is to be attacked by the sleep of ambrosia and bark beetles, which we've shown drive the mortality of the tree. A tree that's been attacked, that has not been attacked by beetles, has a significantly higher probability of recovering than a tree that has been attacked. And we did, we did a study in which we showed that beetles can produce up to 50 different species of fungi deep into the sapwood, which obviously accelerates tree loss. Uh, beetle attacked trees tend to fail at a much higher rate than non attacked attack trees, and in fact, a significant proportion in, um, in a Marin study by 2018, 27% of the trees that failed had failed with green crowns. So there's a health issue, a hazard issue here. Um, and also, the larger the tree, and in particularly in park areas, the large trees tend to be in places that people congregate on, or the places where people congregate, such as open fields, tend to have a lot of large trees next to them. So it becomes an issue of problem for the park district. Now I mentioned that the larger the tree, the more likely to become infected. So um, I'm looking at sort of Redwood Park. This is something like 1,800 coastal live oaks. I broke them down into size class between 0 and 10 to 28 centimeters, et cetera. This is the percentage of infected plus dead in 2011, and this is the percentage in 2015 to 16. So you can see that not only has a lot of mortality, infection and mortality occurred, but the small, the bigger the tree, the higher the rate or the higher percentage. And the Nature Bowl Regional Park, which is of the five parks out there, has the lowest percentage of infection at this point. The same phenomenon observed. Wildcat Canyon Regional Park, even more dramatic, but it's the same general pattern. The bigger the tree, this, there's a little drop off in here. I think this has something to do with the relatively smaller number, but the smaller the tree, the more likely it is to not be infected. Um, so if I look, if I look at previous one is symptomatic plus dead. If I look at symptomatic only, you see the same general trend, although it's not quite as dramatic, but mortality was rather considerably increasing the larger the tree gets. So this disease is, in a sense, selectively removing the larger trees from the landscape. Um, if I, and then I looked at the infection rate that at between 2011 and 2016 to 17, or 15 to 17, as a function of tree size. And the bigger the tree, the higher the rate that that cohort is infected. It does, as I noted before, it tends to tail off here. I'm not quite sure that, why that is, but the smaller the tree, the more likely it is to survive. Uh, then mentioning that the issue, this is, this is tended to be known as a coastal, more of a mesic forest type disease. Um, Diablo Foothills Regional Park is a region, is part of the Regional Park District. It's adjacent to Mount Diablo State Park. Mount Diablo is considerably drier than the East Bay proper, that is the East Bay Hills. And these forests are primarily actually blue, blue oak, Quercus Douglasiae forests, which are much drier, the different type of habitat. We found the highest percentage of infected coastal live oaks in any of the parks we looked at. It's, it's rather astonishing, and the same pattern holds, that the bigger the tree, the more likely to be infected. Um, there wasn't that much mortality there yet, but the interesting thing is that there had been sodwoods as done in this area, and no, no positive humorum plants or had been reported anywhere in this area prior to our discovering that something like 40% of the coastal live oaks were either dead or are symptomatic in these plots. Um, I'm going to switch gears briefly to, this is not really, this is not built to cat, this is actually wild cat. This is a, this is a section of Kilburn Regional Park called Wildcat Canyon. Um, the, we, this is four or five of the plots that we happen to have established over there, and this is this is a little study I was doing. Anyway, this is in 2014. This is Google Earth imagery. 2014, there was no obvious mortality. 2015 looks pretty good. 15, pretty good. 2017, you start to see a little bit. 2018, I don't know how well this shows up, especially if you're blue, green, colorblind, or blue, red, colorblind. No, red, green, colorblind. I, I, I have great sympathy for you because almost everything having to do with this disease is red and green. But, uh, <laughs> 
there are dead trees all around in here. It's uh, quite a few. I actually did a little, just did a little survey of the trees in here, and something in excess of 50 percent of all the Coast Guard folks in here were either dead or infected. Um, that particular little site in 2013, this was the the relationship between infected plus symptomatic plus dead and size. By 2018, this place has exploded. Uh, Tilden Park has gone from a rather quiet um, site for sudden no death impacts to one that's, that's just, it's turning red if you can see the color difference. And these days, if you go out to Tilden Park, you will see lots of dead trees where not long ago there really wasn't much evidence of this. We also, uh, the park district also asked about a couple of these other parks that are somewhat more inland. Um, Pleasanton Ridge and Las Trampas Wilderness, Pleasanton Ridge Regional Park. Uh, I did not do a randomly distributed plot network. We did not, we had neither the resources nor the time, nor for that matter, any way to do it because these are incredibly <coughs> rugged and steep territories. But just on this rather simple, sort of a, <coughs> a flag, a, a quick flyover type assessment, there was a pretty significant amount of mortality in Las Trampas and not that much in Pleasanton Ridge. Where Pleasanton Ridge still looks pretty clean. Las Trampas, you can see dead, dead and infected trees all over the place. These parts are not exactly dry territory, but they are basically on the other side of the hills. So they're in a, a partial rain shadow, and yet there's plenty of sun no death working its way through there. So just looking at actual quantitatively, how many mature, I'm, I'm, basing, I'm basing this on the relationship between diameter and probability of becoming infected. I just did some rather equivalent of back of the envelope type calculations, knowing that these are underestimates because for these parks, it's only based on Oak Bay woodland that is large enough for us to put plots in, but there are plenty of coastal oaks scattered in, in areas that we would not have considered, and the regional park district just considered to be oak habitat, but there's plenty of oaks out there. <coughs> if you look at the percentage, the infection rates, the percentage of infected, the, well, initially an estimate of the total number of coastal live oaks greater than 20 centimeters diameter, and then take it out to the percent dead, and the total numbers, we're looking at up to 30,000 dead trees in Wildcat Canyon Regional Park. Uh, and it's not hard to believe if you actually look into this park. There are areas that look very much like somewhere in the east that a tornado has come through, because most of the trees are on the ground. Um, and then looking at these infection rates and estimates of the total numbers, um, we're as, I'm estimating somewhere in the next neighborhood, some of these parks, we're looking at over 6,000 new infections in these somewhat larger coastal levels per year based on, based on infection rates, based on assessment between 2011 and 2017 or 2018. Uh, another thing I was looking at is, is the odds ratio, which is basically a logistic Regression looking at the at the relation at the probability of new infections based on stem diameter. So I'm looking at the mean diameter of coast live oaks in these five parks and the odds ratio, which is basically the likelihood of, of a tree becoming infected. And there's a very interesting relationship between mean DBH and probability of becoming infected, which Again, it's consistent with what we see, but this is actually the entire park level. Um, so then the real question is, where is this headed? Uh, we've had monitoring in Marin County since 2000. Uh, by 2018, we had in China Camp State Park, approximately 45% of the trees were dead. These are trees that are all confirmed to be pure mora or consistent with it. So if a tree dies for unknown cause, it is not included in any of these calculations. Red Water District took a while, but it's catching up. It's at about 40% in our plots of the coastal live oaks are dead. If you look around across here, there's a lot of higher mortality or infection level in some of these plots, but not that much mortality. But these used to be around 25%. From around 2000 to around 2008, this percentage infected ended up hovering around 22 to 25%. It's dropped considerably, but there aren't that many trees left to infect. So how do these eight 
parts fit in with Marin County, where we have, as I say, almost 20 years of data. So in 20, in our initial, so looking, so these are all, I'm look, this is only looking at trees that were initially asymptomatic, so no disease would start the study, and then we follow to see what develops. And this is mortality, and you can see for Marin County, it's somewhere in the neighborhood of 25% of the initially asymptomatic trees, the total cohort are dead by 2018. If you, if you look at 30, 30 centimeters and above, it's considerably greater, so we're looking at approximately something over 30% of the trees have now been killed. And the point is, here's Wildcat Canyon, here's Chabot, and here's Redwood. Now, they're at the early stages, but it's not hard to imagine that we're going to see the same trajectory. Uh, we also have no data on this, but we've been collecting flow samples to be shipped off of Ohio State University for a loop of analysis lab to potentially analyze for resistant biomarkers if we can ever get the funding to do so. But we basically looked through our went through the East Bay Regional Parks. And when we came back to redo plots, if a tree had previously been symptomatic and was no longer symptomatic, we collected flow samples. We also have some for trees that were persistently hanging on in areas with very high disease levels. And the goal is to see if we can get some sense of how much of this resistance, apparent or survival or resistance, actually is potentially resistance based on the chemistry. And I'm totally out of time, but. Uh, just looking at basal art, we're just basically looking at the, the effect on the total, basically, biomass, ultimately, of the forests. Um, there's, some, there's some pretty large numbers here, like 20, approximately 20% 20 of Redwood's coastline oaks have been killed by sun no as of 2016, which is the last time this was evaluated. Um, so, conclusion. Very large oaks are on their way out. It's hard to see how that's not going to be true. Resistance doesn't seem to be as significant for the bigger the tree. And what's left? Uh, this is China Camp State Park in an area that used to be put. It's, it's near one of our plots. Almost the only green you see there is Bay Laurel. Another site, China Camp State Park. It used to be an overstory canopy. Now that's what you have. Um, Anthony Chabot, I've basically divided into two sections because these actually differ in disease incidence and mean DBH, and also in the abundant end. So I guess getting back to the point of what, what's, what's left out there. So if I look at Anthony Chabot, if you look at the proportion of trees in the four dominant species that we found in these plots, after you get beyond coastal evoking bay laurel, there's really not very much left. And there's a lot of introduced stuff. There's, there's post redwood here and there, but that's not dominant. And that's not our post live oak dominant. Um, we've got some interior live oaks and canyon, canyon live oak. I just looked this up. Harvard Forest in Massachusetts tallies over 70 wooded species. Compare that to what we've got in the East Bay Regional Parks or Marin County, and it's very hard to see what's coming in after this. We have seedlings. And I mentioned this East Anthony Chabot Park. North versus south differ really considerably in the abundance of, of oak seedlings, small seedlings, many, and medium sized and also saplings. Coastal oak really dominates over the bay in terms of its impact on the forest. So even if you take if you take the coastal oak, the bay is going to have considerably less of a useful impact. And I'll just finish up way beyond my time. These trees are going. In fact, these, I took this photograph in 2013. This is in, in Tulin Park. That tree was fine in 2013. It's now dead. And it's the only dead tree in the area. It's by far the biggest tree in the area. Um, so the future is not a sunny one for big oak trees or for the things that people like about California's forests, which is the really large oaks. I'd like to acknowledge the support for a number of people over the years, and uh, particularly the East Bay Regional Park District, which provided, has provided funding for this work. All right, thank you very much. Sorry, I was too long.